We're in Psalm 51. I'm going to skip the intro tonight because I don't know how long it's going to take. If I go by word count, I'm way over my word count, so I don't know. And I want to try to get done by quarter after because we got four songs to do tonight. Um, we're going to just do Psalm 51 because it's one of my favoritest psalms, and when we get to my favoritest psalms, I get to have the, the, the ability to say, let's slow down and just enjoy this thing. And uh, so we're going to be in, hey guys, good to see you too. All right, awesome. So we're in Psalm 51, and I'm calling this David's Confession. You might even come up with a much better title than me. I'm just simple. I'm just going to call it David's Confession. The title underneath it, it says, To the chief musician, a, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Now, this is one of the psalms where the background is very very important. It, it helps you understand what's, what's going on through this psalm. David is the king. He is the man after God's own heart. I mean, that's pretty cool, huh? That's, pre, that's, a, that's a pretty awesome title. The man after God's own heart. He, God, told, God told King Saul that he was going to get a man after his own heart. Even before David, long before David became king, a man after God's own heart. But this man after God's own heart was a notorious sinner. He was a notorious sinner. You kind of don't think those two things should match each other, do you? We have all neat and clean in our tidy little ways of th looking at things. We think that those two things are completely mutually exclusive, but they are not. They are not. The story about David in this, the, the pre-story starts in 2 Samuel chapter 11 when David caught a glimpse of a beautiful young woman taking a bath. He makes a phone call. She comes over to his house. They have sex. He finds out uh, a month or so later that she's pregnant. And then he tries to cover the whole... This sounds like, a, it sounds like a TV show or something, you know? And then he tries to cover the whole thing up by coming up with this convoluted plot which eventually leads to her husband's death. Then he marries the grieving widow and adopts the kid as his own. God saw everything. He saw everything. That's good and that's bad. Now, it's good when you're the victim of something. It's kind of good to know that God saw everything. Amen, Cindy? God sees everything. But when you're the one, when you're the little stinker who's, who's caused so much trouble and you're trying very desperately to, to cover it all up, it's not too encouraging to remember that God sees everything. But God saw what David was doing. And so God sent the prophet Nathan, to confront David over his sin. And, and if you remember, um, Nathan tells David this story to kind of draw him in. He tells him this story about this rich man who, who decides to steal his neighbor's one little pet little lamb, and he kills the lamb for his own guests, you know. And it's just, just you're so angry by the end of the story. And David, too, is just angry at the end of the story. He says, well, the guy needs to be killed. Kill the guy. Kill the guy, you know. Because David is used to people bringing stories and telling him stuff, and he gets a judgment and says what should happen. And then you know there's that po point in the story where Nathan stops, the st stops, and he points to David, and he says, you are the man. And Nathan said in Chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, verse 9. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon because he sent him back into the battle. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor 
and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord, has all, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. What a, what a horrible thing to, uh, uh, to know that you've been found. You've been found out. And so this is the backstory. This is the story from which David writes a song. This is David's song. He expands the confession. His confession was more than just telling Nathan, I have sinned. Verse 1. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Now, he uses three words here. Actually, it's interesting because he uses, uh, between verse 1 and verse 2, he uses like the entire Hebrew vocabulary for sin. He uses every, every type of word that you could think of for sin. But here he uses three words, mercy, loving kindness, and tender mercies. And the lesson I want to call this, count on grace. These words, mercy, loving kindness, tender mercy. There's three different Hebrew words here. And these words are at the very core of how God describes his own character. This is who God is. This is who God is. When Moses asked to know God better, this is how God described himself to Moses. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious abounding in goodness and truth. He uses the same three words, a little translated, a little bit different. Several years ago, a a businessman found out about an elderly widow who was unable to pay her rent. Feeling pity for her, he went to some of his friends and asked them if they would be kind enough to contribute something to pay her rent. They responded, and together they got together two months' worth of rent. So he goes to the widow's house that week to deliver the money. And although he knows that she's inside, when he went to knock on the door, he gets no answer. He knocks a second time, still no answer. He knocks a third time, still no answer. He knocks a fourth time. Not knowing what else to do, he he goes back to his business. A couple days later, he sees the woman on the sidewalk looking destitute. He walks up to her and says, ma'am, some friends of of mine and and I, we found out about your situation. We want to help. We got enough money together to give you rent money for two months. I came to your house to give it to you this week. I knocked several times and got no answer. She took a gasp of breath and put her hand to her face, and she said, Oh, I thought you were the landlord coming to evict me. So what do you expect when God knocks on your door? Are you expecting the eviction notice? Are you expecting the, I have it with you. No, no, you got it all wrong. You don't know who God is. At his very being, at his very core, he is grace, gracious, kind, loving, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. That's who God is. We need to count on his grace. Verse 2, he says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. My sin is always before me. Now, it has been about a year since David screwed up. It's been about a year. Um, Remember, he gets the gal pregnant, Bathsheba. She's gotten pregnant. I mean, there's a couple months there. Because we're not talking about days of, you know, little pee on the stick thing, you know, or, or kill the rabbit or what people used to do to find out if you're pregnant, you know, it, this, so, so it's at least, what, three months, two, three months before the, she even finds out she's pregnant, and then they go all the way through this whole thing about putting Uriah to death and all this kind of stuff, 
and he marries the girl and they have the baby. It's, it's been maybe a year, you know, and there's a baby. And all through this time, all David can think about is his sin. It becomes an all-consuming passion. I don't know if you remember this, but back in the late 1980s, Jim Baker was on the TV. He was one of those televangelists. Uh, Jim Baker and his wife's name was Tammy Faye. Everybody remembers. Part of the down, he was convicted of fraud and conspiracy. He went to prison. And part of the downfall of his ministry involved an affair he had with a gal named Jessica Hahn. In his book, I Was Wrong, he writes this. I knew that I was doing, that what I was doing went directly against everything I believed as a Christian. I had never cheated on my wife in all our years of marriage. Jessica Hahn, however, seemed quite comfortable with the situation. I simply abandoned myself to the moment. We did not make love. We had sex. When it was over, I quickly left the room and in a daze, hurried to the elevator and pressed the button marking the eighth floor. The winter afternoon sun was already beginning to slide down on the horizon as I stepped inside my room. I was horrified. Oh, God. What have I done? I had not considered the consequences of my absurd attempt to make Tammy Faye jealous. I had not even paused to think of the potential ramifications of my actions while I was giving in to the temptation of having sex with a woman other than my wife. I had simply reacted. I had opened the door to an attack on the ministry I headed, on my family, and on me personally. Worse yet, the devil had not made me do any of it. I had done it of my own stubborn will. I disrobed and immediately stepped into the shower, turning, turning the water on as hot as I could stand it. I never felt so dirty in all my life. Maybe if I make the water hotter, it will wash it all away, I thought. David said, my sin is always before me. So that's the problem. Is we, we, we don't think of the consequences, do we? And yet, when you look back to the times that you've screwed up, because I can guarantee every one of you in this room has screwed up. In some level, in something. I, I, don't, I don't even have a word, a word of knowledge. Dan Looney, you have sinned. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. See, I, and I only picked on him because he's my friend. I don't want to, I don't want to pick anybody else to call out somebody's name. They're going to be horrified. What's he going to say? Because we've all sinned. And you remember, don't you? Don't you remember how horrified you were when you realized the depth of what you have done? My sin is always before me. Verse 4, David says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Against you and you only have I sinned. There is a need, friends, the need for confession. David needs forgiveness. He is asking for forgiveness, but he only receives forgiveness on the condition that he acknowledges his sin, that he admits that he sinned. That's the same for you and I, friend. You don't just say, I, I, I need your forgiveness, God. You've got to admit what you've done. You need to confess your sin. And ultimately, you might be thinking, what means against you and you only? What's he just, he, he forgets the fact that he killed somebody, you know? No, 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 no. Ultimately, ultimately, all sin is against God. And so forgiveness has to start, it's the starting place, is confessing your sin before God. In Psalm 32, David talks about how horrible life was while he was under this cloud of condemnation. And in Psalm 32, 5, he says, I acknowledged my sin to you, my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity 
of my sin. Forgiveness comes after confession, after admitting what I've done. And, and, and don't think that because you've asked God for forgiveness that that's all you need to do. When our sin has hurt other people, he's just not talking about that here. But when our sin affects other people, you need to go to them as well, to the offended party. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 23, he says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, you know, when you come to church and they pass the offering basket and you put your money in the little bag and there you remember that your brother has something against you, you really stuck it to somebody. He says, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. In other words, before you think that everything's all right with God, when you've hurt someone else, you also need to go make things right with them as well. Verse 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin, my mother conceived me. Now, he's not saying that it, the act of conceiving a child is sinful. He's saying that from the moment of conception, he has possessed a sin nature. We are all like that. We've all, we're all sinners. He says, verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. You desire truth in the inward parts, and the lesson is about growing in truth. It is very possible, friends, to live your life under the delusion of a fantasy. We don't like certain parts of our lives, and so we either pretend that they're not there or we tell ourselves little stories about why, why I did this or why this person did this to me. And i got to tell you, you aren't going anywhere in life. You're, never gonna, you're, you're always going to be stuck until you stop lying to yourself and still, until you admit the truth, because God desires truth in the inward parts. He wants you to be real in the inward parts. Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up in all things unto him who is the head. In other words, you grow up when you learn truth, when you speak the truth. The Greek word for truth, aletheia, means literally not covered. So you stop covering things up. And see, that's how we grow. That's how we mature as people, is when we stop covering things up. D.L. Moody, a great preacher back in the 1800s, he once visited a prison called The Tombs. It's in New York. And he went there to preach to the inmates. After he'd finished speaking, Moody talked with a number of the men in their cells. He asked each prisoner this question. What brought you here? Again and again, he received replies like this. I don't deserve to be here, or I was framed, or... I was falsely accused, or I was given an unfair trial. Not one inmate would admit his, he was guilty. Finally, Moody found a man with his face buried in his hands, weeping. And he said, what's wrong, my friend? The prisoner responded, my sins are more than I can bear. Relieved to find at least one man who would recognize his guilt and need for forgiveness, the evangelist exclaimed, thank God for that. And Moody had the joy of pointing this man to the saving knowledge of Christ to find freedom, not from the shackles of prison, but the shackles of his sin. When you finally admit the truth. I have a friend who's in a 12-step program, and he has a catchphrase that I like. He calls it rigorous honesty. I like that. I like that. Rigorous honesty. Do you practice rigorous honesty? honesty that's that's a that's that's really good i like that are you rigorously honest because that's how we grow friends god desires truth in the inward part we're going to talk more about that on sunday too because i couldn't believe like on monday how many t I, all the all these it's like i'm seeing a pattern the things that we're studying on Sunday affect the things that we're studying tonight, and there are things I was reading in my quiet time, and it's just kind of like blowing my mind. It's like, I think I'm supposed to preach on this for like a week straight or something, you know, because God wants us to be honest with ourselves as well as with each other. He says, verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter 
than snow. Hyssop. Now, there is some disagreement over what hyssop is. And that's because there is a, a bush in Europe called, the, called hyssop. Um, but it doesn't grow in Israel or Egypt. And uh, so that's probably not the same hyssop. Because this hyssop is something that was found in Egypt and in Israel. And so um, the, most of the scholars seem to agree that it was Syrian oregano. Now, I don't know if they made pizza with it, because that's what I think of when I think of oregano. I think of the spices in the, in the mozzarella sauce, you know, a little oregano. Anyway, that's Syrian oregano. Um, in the Old Testament, the word is found in three different contexts, but they all have to do with cleansing. In Exodus 12, it's found in the story of the Passover, the very first Passover, when they took the blood of, of lambs, they had it in little basins, and they would paint it on the doorposts of the house. Well, you know what they used for paintbrushes? They used hyssop. They painted it with hyssop. It is found in Leviticus chapter 14, a different kind of a ritual. And this was the ritual that would be performed whenever a leper, what not leopard, but a leper, was healed, which is like practically never, um, because it would have to be a miracle of God. But if a leper were to ever be healed, there's this this elaborate ritual uh, in Leviticus 14 where you take a little bit of cedar wood, some scarlet thread, the blood of a bird, and then uh, you take a living bird, and you you, you take this whole mixture, with you mix it all up with water, and you dip the living bird in this mixture that has hyssop and blood and scarlet thread and cedar wood, and then you set it free. And I think it's kind of a picture of resurrection, of cleansing, but it was used during this ritual. Hyssop is part of this ritual. It is also found in, in Numbers chapter 19, um, a very strange passage um, where you have this 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 uh, prescription, this recipe to create this stuff called the ashes of a red heifer. Um, and uh, you, you, I don't know if you, oh, I'm going to go off on a tangent, so I won't do it. Anyway, um, the ashes of a red heifer were used to create what's called the water of purification, which would be which would help people become cleansed if they'd ever touched dead people and a couple other things. They would use this water of purification. And it had to be this special mixture of a special red cow that gets sacrificed in a certain prescribed way. And part of what gets mixed into the ashes as they're burning this cow is you throw in hyssop. So all through it, There's one common thread about hyssop. It's all about cleansing. It's all about cleansing. David writes, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. Not white as snow, but whiter than snow. I'm going to talk about cleansing. Scientists have discovered that every snowflake has a tiny piece of dust at its core. That means even snowflakes have dirty hearts. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so maybe that's why you can be whiter than snow. I have found, personally, in my life, there are two things that I find helpful when it comes to cleansing from sin. First is blood. It's the blood that cleanses my heart. When we confess our sin, we become cleansed. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think this cleansing comes through the blood of Jesus. There's that old song that his blood can make the foulest clean. 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There is a sense that our hearts are cleansed. Forgiveness comes. Guilt is getting rid, of, gotten rid of through the blood of Jesus. I think it's interesting that there's, um, that there's a connection here of fellowship. I think that there's a connection that sometimes that uh, it's rubbing against each other. 
that helps bring that cleansing, admitting the truth to each other, is important. Blood brings cleansing, but water brings cleansing. And I think of the water as what cleanses my mind. I don't know about you, but there are times when I know factually, scripturally, that I've been forgiven because I confessed my sin and I should, I should, for I, first John 1 9, I confessed my sin. I am, I am cleansed. But I still got a dirty little mind. Something I've done, something I've seen, some place I've been is giving me a dirty little mind. It's hard to get rid of that dirty little mind. That's where the water comes in. In Ephesians 5.26, it says that, that he, Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word. I think an excellent way to clean my dirty little mind is to run some water through it. Run the word through it. Spend some time in the word. It's amazing how dirty little thoughts have a hard time sticking around when you're reading about Jesus. I still know how that works, but it works. So I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. When you screwed up and you've blown it big time, wash yourselves. Wash yourselves. I, and I shall be whiter than snow, David writes. Verse 8. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. The bones you have broken. Now this sounds a little bit mean. But I call this lesson getting my attention because, frankly, sometimes God has to do some stuff to get our attention, doesn't he? You've ever been, that, been in a situation like that where something happened because you've just been totally blowing, it up, blowing things and God has to do something to get your attention? Have you ever been there? I've been there. Um, when a young lamb continually strays from the flock, one of the things a shepherd might do, he might actually have to resort to break the lamb's leg to keep it from running away. But he doesn't leave it there with a broken leg. He'll then carry the lamb. He'll carry the lamb on his shoulders till the leg is broken and, and give the, this sense of bonding with the lamb so the lamb won't go astray. Sometimes God will do something drastic to get our attention. The bones you have broken. Jeremiah saw the destruction of Babylon as being an example of God having to wound his people to get their attention. Lamentation says, though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the, son, the children of men. God doesn't love to cause us grief, but sometimes he will do it if it's necessary to get our attention. David said, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The word that he uses for create is bara. It means to shape, to fashion, to create. And there are two different Hebrew words in the Old Testament that are both translated to create. One of them is the word asa, which kind of means to shape or form or mold. It's the word that was used when God formed Adam out of the dust. He took something that already existed and he put it together and pushed it and, and made man out of the dust. But there's a second word that means to create out of nothing which when God created the heavens and the earth, he spoke and boom, out of nothing, suddenly the heavens and the earth were there. And that's this word. So when, when he says, create in me a clean heart, he's not saying, give me a, uh, you know, uh, rework it a little bit. No, he's, he's giving me, give me God a brand new heart. Give me a brand new heart. He says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. I think some of what David is writing about comes from his own personal experience of what he watched going on in his own boss's life in his younger years. 
with King Saul. Because Saul was a man who lived in continual, well, after a while, he, he started rebelling against God and just rebelled over and over and over again. And because of Saul's continual rebellion against God, 1 Samuel 16, verse 13 says, well then, so the prophet Samuel went out to look for a new king. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. I think that I can't help but think that David's got this in mind when he's saying this. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He saw what happened in Saul's life. Now, can this happen to us as a New Testament believer? I want to talk about eternal security. Can a believer lose their salvation because of sin in their life? I have two answers for that. The first one is no. The second one, maybe. I mean, I'll explain. First is the no. I do think that there's a sense that you and I should not be afraid that we're every five seconds we're going to lose our salvation. I think that's a very unhealthy thing. Our salvation is based on God's grace towards us, not the works that we do. Ephesians 4, 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So you were saved because Jesus died for you, not because you were good enough to be saved. After 20 years of shaving himself every morning, a man in a small southern town decided he'd had enough. He told his wife that he intended to let the local barber shave him each day. So he put on his hat and coat, and he went to the barber shop, who, which was owned by the pastor of the town's Baptist church. The barber's wife was named Grace, and she was working that day, so she performed the, 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 the task. Grace shaved him and sprayed him with lilac water and said, that'll be $20. The man thought the price was a little bit high, but he paid the bill, and he went, and he went to work. The next morning, the man looked in the mirror, and his face was as smooth as it had been when he left the barber shop the day before. Not bad, he thought. At least I don't have to need to get a shave every day. The next morning, the man's face was still smooth. Two weeks later, the man was still unable to find any trace of whiskers on his face. It was more than he could take, so he goes back to the barber shop, and he says, I thought $20 was high for a shave, he told the barber's wife. But you've done a great job. It's been two weeks, and my whiskers still haven't started growing back. The expression on her face didn't change. She was expecting this. She said, well, you were shaved by grace, once shaved, always shaved. Better enjoy it, folks. That's the only joke you get all night. <laughs> Once shaved, always shaved. Okay. Jesus said, and I give them eternal life, talking about his flock, and they shall never perish, never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. I think that's a good case for you to stop worrying about whether you're going to lose your salvation. Nobody can snatch you out of his hand. Now, wait a minute, though. I thought you said you had two answers. I do have two answers. Can I lose, your, can I lose my salvation? There is a possibility, and that's why I can't give you an unequivocal no. And my position has changed over the years because I keep reading my Bible, and there are some troubling scriptures which, I got to tell you, when I went through seminar, I learned how to deal with these troubling questions and how to answer them and twist them a little bit so that they fit what I was thinking. But I kind of got tired of twisting what is the obvious meaning of the scriptures. One of them, the most troubling one, is probably uh, the one you've all read, Hebrews 6, where, where the writer says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. I can't see that describe anybody but who's been saved. How can you partake of the Holy Spirit unless you've been saved? It's impossible, and they've tasted the good word, word of God and the powers of the age to come. It's impossible if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. 
since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. I can't see any way of what this means other than the possibility that people who have once known the Lord at some point no longer know the Lord. I, I don't, I, you, know, you can run all the, you maybe you've read books and everything and you've heard sermons and you can tell me, I, I've heard it all. I, I understand that, but I just, I can't get around this one. The other one, eh, there's lots of them, but another one, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5 in his book, which is all about grace, the book of, of Galatians. It's all about, about uh, grace and not, not works. And he says this, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy. Now it's, he's starting to get a little personal here. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath. I kind of take offense at that, Paul. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I know that you can say, well, that only is describing unbelievers. But when I read that list, and if I'm honest, there have been times when I have been doing that. I've been doing that. So here's how I see this. Though I hold dearly to Jesus' promise that nothing can take me from his hand, I think there may, may be a point in a person's life where they have continually rebelled against God and their hearts get so hardened that they no longer care about the things of God. And I think that person may be in danger of losing their salvation. And frankly, they're a person who no longer cares about losing their salvation. I think that's chief in this puzzle, that they no longer even care. I don't think this is a place that, that's easy to get to. I think it only comes from years of rejecting God's prompting to turn around. And if you are struggling with sin and are convicted over your sin, you are not in this category. Because the fact that you are convicted over your sin shows me that the Spirit of God is at work in your life, saying, wake up, idiot, turn around. He hasn't, he hasn't let, let go of you yet. He hasn't stopped loving you. It's when you stop caring and continue to rebel that you're in danger of maybe crossing a line that you can't come back from. But the fact that you're still struggling shows to me that God has not abandoned you. I hope that makes sense. But that's what I think. I may be wrong, um, but I, I, I'm not. <laughs> no, no, first of all. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll repent. I'm sorry. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Do you realize being saved ought to be a joyful thing? Joy ought to be a part of the believer every once in a while. David wrote, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Even when we're in a difficult circumstance, we can still have a taste, a taste of joy from time to time. We can even command joy. We can do it out of obedience. Paul was in prison when he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The book of Philippians is Paul's letter of joy, his epistle of joy. That's why Dave Dunnigan loves it. That's why it's his favorite book of the Bible, is Philippians. The, it's the book of joy. But he wrote it, in prison of all places. See, you, you, you can have joy even in difficult times. Um, but when you're struggling with your sin, well, there's no joy in that, is there? No. And so he says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He asked God to help him turn it around. And he says, uphold me by your generous spirit. That's New King James translation. The word that's translated generous in the Hebrew is nadib, which means inclined, 
willing, noble, or generous. And it could mean that God, he's talking about that God will support David with his generous Holy Spirit. Could be. It could also mean that God would sustain David by giving, by giving David a generous or a willing spirit or willing attitude. New Living Translation says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. I like that. I like that. I, I remember years ago um, when I was a, a high school pastor, um, one of the kids in my youth group kind of blew me away with his prayer request was, uh, God, help me want to do my homework. <laughs> I was thinking, and I was thinking, he's brilliant. <laughs> he's brilliant. That's how you want to do your homework. You ask God to give you a willing heart. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. And the lesson here is learning to share with others. I think this is a sign that your repentance from sin against God is real. That your repentance is real. Is that that you're going to take what you've learned and you share it with others. In AA, the 12th step reads, Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. David says, God, help me to turn this around and I will teach transgressors your ways. What do you think he's doing with the song? And why do you think King David, the man after God's own heart, allowed his horrible, wicked story to be told? He's trying to teach you a lesson so you don't go down the road he went down. Verse 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The word that's translated guilt of bloodshed, actually the Hebrew word is, is simply means blood. Deliver me from blood. And it's talking about the punishment that was required for David's sins. David deserved a death sentence, not once, but twice. He he deserved death for adultery with Bathsheba, and he he deserved death for murdering Uriah, which, by the way, Uriah was one of his best friends. He was one of the 30 mighty men. It's one of his men and brothers in arms. Um, And he he killed him after having sex with the guy's wife. We, too, deserve death. Paul says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 15, open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. I think he's saying that he's going to keep his mouth shut until God does his full work in David, and then David will give God praise. Verse 16, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Um, It says you do not desire sacrifice. And and the idea is obedience over sacrifice. God does require sacrifice for sin. That's why Jesus came, to be the ultimate sacrifice. But God would rather, he'd really, really rather that you just don't sin. You know, we say, oh, I can just always confess my sins and he'll forgive me. So let's just go, let's go party tonight. Let's all go to the bar tonight after church, you know. Let's just go do something stupid, you know. And and, because Jesus will forgive us. No, 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 no. God really, really would wish that you just stop sinning. He wants you to stop. Um, Samuel said to Saul, after Saul's continued disobedience, he said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. That's what David's talking about. He says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart These, O God, you will not despise. The word contrite here, I know this is kind of odd, but the way it's translated contrite, if you look back in verse 8, where he says, remember, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. The word in verse 8 that's translated broken is actually the word for contrite here. And the idea is that David was broken by God. And being broken by God, that's what contrition is all about. I'm contrite. God has broken me. He's broken me. Watchman Nee wrote, our spirit 
is released according to the degree of our brokenness. The one who has accepted the most discipline is the one who can best serve. The more one is broken, the more sensitive he is. The more we desire to save ourselves in that very thing, we become spiritually useless. Whenever we preserve and excuse ourselves at that point, we are deprived of spiritual sensitivity and supply. Let no one imagine he can be effective and disregard this basic principle. We need brokenness. If you want to see God's work in your life, we need to be broken over our sin. Brokenness is what I long for. Brokenness is what I need. Verse 18, do good in your good pleasure to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with, whole, with burnt offering and a whole burnt offering. Then you shall offer bulls on your altar. Now this verse 19, I, he says you'll be pleased. When your heart is right with God, then the things that you offer to him are pleasing to him. That's when it's pleasing, is when you get your heart right with him. One last thing just to play around with, to think about in your head, this build back in verse 18. He says, build the walls of Jerusalem. What does that have to do with confessing your sins? I think it has to do with sin's consequences. Because my sin lowers my defenses. The walls of a city are the thing that protects the city from the enemies. That's what keeps the enemies out, is the walls. And when I sin... It's like I'm breaking down the walls around my life. I think that there's no coincidence that it's harder to resist temptation of things that you've already once done. Why? Because you've broken down the wall in that area of your life. And so it's easier to give in. Um, there's a hole in the wall. And my sin also affects others. Nathan had already warned David that his sin would become an example to David's own son. Absalom would repeat David's own uh, adultery and do it publicly out in the middle of everything with everybody. Um, these are good things to think about when I'm tempted. I need to think about the consequences. You know, there's that voice in you that says... Um, we're going to do the worship. Well, let's go, let's go do the worship. But let, me, but let me just say this. There's that voice inside of us that says, oh, just do it and get it over with and the pressure will be gone. No, no. You're breaking down the walls. You're making it easier to do it the next time. So it's better to build the walls and to say no. We have a record four songs on this one psalm. So I'm sorry. And the first one is a song I wrote 40 years ago when I was only two years old. And I gotta tell you, I, I wrote it during a time when I was really struggling with my sin. Gracious to me, O oh God, according to thy kindness, according to thy compassion. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin.
transgression and my sin is ever before me against thee the only I have sinned
about this for a while. Father, we are so thankful for the cleansing that comes 
through the blood of Jesus. Thank you, God, that you can forgive us, that you will forgive us. Your mercies are new every morning, and we give you honor, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. God bless you.